Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered how in the world to get out of the crisis we're in, individually or collectively, then do we have the How We Can Build a Better World show for you. Today I'll be talking with one of my all-time favorite guests and human beings, Dr. Irvin Laszlo, winner of numerous Peace Prizes, two times Nobel Peace Prize nominee, the discoverer of the Akashic Field, and the author of many of my favorite books and treatises, including How We Can Build a Better World. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how we can positively survive, thrive, and plug in to shift our lives, shift the planet, and leave a sustainable home for countless generations to come. That plus we'll talk about genomes and phenomes, a sacred dance, the Akashic field, coherence and oneness, and what in the world using the force has to do with anything. So welcome back to the show, Irvin. Are you ready to shine? Michael, with you, it's easy to shine. We can shine together. That's the main thing, to do it together. Woohoo! <laughs> I love it. And with you, Irvin, it's easy to shine. So Going from shining, I can't believe I'm going to begin here, but before we dive right into things, are we truly in a global crisis right now? We are, and that's a good thing. It seems strange to say, but it's a good thing because a crisis is a passport mm -hmm. to change. And here we have an option to change, not only change for the worse, not only change going back to what we had, but to innovate. Without a crisis, there is no real progress in the world. Never has been, never will be. Now, we have a crisis. It's a passport. It's a key. So let's use it. I don't say that we have to have all the sacrifices. We try to make it through without human sacrifice. But we have a chance. And that's why it's a good thing to have a crisis as long as we can handle it. Thank you. And that brings up a few key points. Uh, as long as we can handle it is, is one key part of this. We don't have a choice but to go through this crisis, do we? No. The choice is really not to get stuck in the crisis. It's impossible uh, that we wouldn't survive. Humanity would survive. So the, the choice is to change. Mm -hmm. But how to change? That is the choice. And I think this is our option to be able to create something new. Seems strange to say they are always looking for something new, but this time we can, because the old is not functional, has become dysfunctional, and now we know it, and so we have to get through the crisis and land on a new territory. We can do it. We can talk about how to do it, but I think the main thing is we can do it and we must do it. And it's, it's been a theme when we've been on our RV tour. We literally just came off of our RV tour last week. We're in a new off-the-grid home. We're learning all of our systems. And my theme throughout this has been, we've got this. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how exactly how we're going to get there. But we've got this. If we pull together and believe it and are willing to change, we can get through this time. Absolutely right. I mean, pull together. That, I think, is the motto. We have to finally realize that we are in this together. There's no better demonstration than a pandemic, which affects all people, all human beings throughout the planet. No better demonstration that we are indeed all in it together. We are on it for the better or for the worse. Let's make the better of it. I like it. You know, here in the U.S., and I'm sure it's everywhere with the Internet, and we might dive around to this, there's conspiracy theory A, there's conspiracy theory B, there's this person created it, that country created it, the pandemic is a pandemic, this, that, or the other thing. But when it comes down to it, no matter how this started, as far as the um, evolution of the species, this isn't random happenstance, is it? As long as the evolution of the species, this is a recurrent phenomenon. It seldom is a global event, as a pandemic truly, but a crisis of some kind or another, whether it's a political crisis, a military crisis, an environmental crisis, whatever, but a crisis periodically sets in. Usually it's a local crisis, sometimes it's a national crisis, sometimes a regional crisis. It can now be a global crisis. It is a global crisis. So it's not unusual. But for us, it's something new. So that the world we have created will go on forever. Well, it doesn't. 
and just as well that it doesn't, because sooner or later it would land us in another crisis. So now here we are suffering something that has kicked us out of our habitual form for our, from our ruts. We are being kicked out of it, and now the question is, what new path, what new road are we taking? That's what I want to talk about. Thank you, and, and let's go there. And specifically, there's a, there's a term that's coming to mind. I want to talk about bifurcation, but going along the lines of bifurcation, in, in evolutionary terms, and I, I think uh, uh, Darwin and, and many others had evolution wrong, there was evolution versus revolution. There are these nodal points at which you have to shift to a higher state or you don't make it through. There are no intermediary steps. So I'm, I'm curious, what is this bifurcation we're in right now that is requiring us to make a major leap? It's a leap. We are in the midst of a leap. Unsustainability is the key word that we have to remember. This simply means that the world that we had created before the pandemic, even without the pandemic, would not have been able to go on as it is. One or another crisis would have, would have come in. Whether it's an environmental crisis, a social crisis, a military crisis, something would happen because it was, it's unsustainable the way we have created. We've been talking about that for 20, 30 years, you know. We've got to change. But now the time has come where we demonstrate it. We see it. We've got to change. So the fact of the matter is here we are in the midst of change. Now, the question that pose ourselves, I think that's what you're asking, that's what you're talking about. If we got to change, which way do we get through it? We'll get through it somewhere or another. I think humanity will not go down. We're already finding a way to handle this. We're already on the point of mastering this crisis. So the question is, how do we really get through it? Where do we go from here? We, we, let's leave it to the to the medical researchers. Let's leave it, hopefully, also to the to the health people and to the politicians to to be able to 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 give us all the vaccine. But there is no vaccine for the next crisis. How do we have a, what kind of a vaccine do we have for global warming, for the sea level rise, for 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 aridity, for the spread of the deserts, etc. You see. So there's no handy way to handle it other than, and that's what we want to talk about, other than changing the way we operate. We have got to operate differently at this spaceship, which we call Earth. And this is our chance to learn that we can do it because the old one is no longer working. Now we got a demonstration. So let's make use of it. Thank you. And I want to talk about how we use this new operating system. I was talking with a shaman very recently, and we were talking about kind of a Jungian concept. It's a shamanic concept. It's, it's, it's in every indigenous people around the world of the dream world is the waking world. And, and, and what that means to me is, and, and I wonder if you agree, that what's going on in the outer world is a reflection of what we get to do on the inside and the internal shift we get to make that is then going to reflect around us. Well, there is in us something which is not so evident at first sight. There is in us something which in the natural world is expressed as the search for or the drive toward coherence, toward integrality, toward wholeness, and which in our emotional world is expressed as love, as a sense of belongingness, as sense of sense of oneness. That is in us. That is in every atom in the world, in every quantum. The proton and the neutron are in are a love affair. You see, when they're attracting an electron, they're attracting another member of their family. Yeah. And then they create the hydrogen atom, and then a helium atom, and then, and then all the rest, um, to, like, to uranium, and then to get, get to molecule, and get to shells, and get to webs of life. It's in us, if you recognize this, if we go back, when I say going back, I don't mean going back to the world that we have created before yeah. the pandemic. I mean going back to what we truly are, what is truly in us. In us is this drive towards coherence. Because the world could not be what it is, could not have developed what it is, what it developed into without this drive. If this would be a random world, it would still be a set of inert gases floating around the space and time. This is a coherent world. Einstein said that very clearly. Our most miraculous aspect of this world is that it is so coherent that we can understand it. So here we are. 
you have lost the contact with this coherence, now we can get it back. And this is a very concrete thing, we can talk about it, but it's something we can go back. Back not to the world that we have created, but back to what we truly are. A being, a being who is part of a universal drive toward higher and higher levels of coherence, higher levels of integration, higher levels of oneness. This is how we moved from molecules all the way to living systems, to entire biospheres, and to galaxies. This is a world that is driving toward coherence. We've forgotten it, that we are part of it. Let's remember it. And then we have, we have the key. Then we know what to do. Because when we do it together, try to do it ourselves, put ourselves first, never mind the rest, then we fail. We have failed. Now it's time to change and recognize who we are. That, I think, is the key. How have we lost coherence and how do we get it back? We thought that we could do without it. We thought we are above it. We thought we are bigger and better than anything else around us. And then you are not coherent with others if you pull yourself away out of the context of the others. Technology is a marvelous thing, but it's a two-edged sword. We are using technology to serve our own separate ends. Mm -hmm. As the recent political slogan, which I hope we are not operating so much anymore, is that we were trying to make ourselves great ourselves great without regard to what others are. Yeah. If we make our society great, we'll be great. If we make the web of life great, we'll make our society great. We have to look at the whole system in which we operate. We've forgotten that. We thought we are separate. That's how we lost it. We thought we can use technology just to pursue our own ends, just to mine all the resources that nature can offer just to make use of the planet for our own immediate satisfactions, for hunger, for money, and for power. And that was a mistake. You cannot operate in such a delicate overall system as the web of life on this planet with the idea that I'm going to take care of myself and never mind the rest. That was a mistake. And I think now we're becoming, coming to realize this. And it's about high time. We can regain our coherence by coming back into the context of life. Context of life on the planet, context of humanity. We are not alone, we are together. And we should remember that together, but only together, we can make it. The ancients knew this, the great sages, the spiritual leaders knew this, the great scientists know this. We have forgotten it in society. It's time to get back. Well, there's a wonderful saying by Gandhi that people always quote, and I like to quote it also. Be the change that you want to see in the world. We need to change and let ourselves, as you ask, how do we do it? How do we do each of us do this? Get back. Get back to what the old people, the old civilizations, the traditions knew, what the great spiritual systems know, what the great religions know. But the great scientists and, and the and scientific theorists know and tell us that we are a system together. We are we are elements of a system, elements of a whole. This has been has had a bad uh, bad press uh, for the past fifty years or so. Wholeness, a holism, it's as considered metaphysics. And now the new biology is a holistic biology. The new cosmology is a holistic cosmology. It seems things not operate separately. Things work well when they work together. Cooperation, not competition. We and not me and mine. So that's the lesson. If we operate in this, this new system, we are actually operating in a timeless way. That we have mankind in its five million year or so history as a conscious species because physically a bit much way back, but as a conscious species. Uh, five million years as a separate species, maybe as a higher level of consciousness, separate consciousness, 30, 40,000 years. And only the last couple of hundred years, we are paying the consequences of forgetting where we have come from. We have come from the ambit, from the womb of a collective universe, of a wholeness. We have considered ourselves separate, better, larger, cleverer than the rest. 
but we cannot recreate the world around us as we want. We can only become part of it. And but together we can make it. Together we can not only survive, together we can flourish. Because life always flourishes. Life always evolves, becomes bigger, becomes moved to new territories when it works together with its environment, when everything in in that system works together. In fact, we couldn't even survive for a year or, 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 or a month even if not all the systems in our body worked actually and keenly and precisely together. Any part of the system doesn't work well together. It's a disease. It's an illness. We try to pull it back. But let's pull back our own being with, to the others. We, we know it. It's not difficult. We just have to go back to ourselves. We have to, what you feel. What do you feel when you really go back to yourselves? Yes. And if you really go back, if you really feel yourself, you feel yourself in the ambit, in the womb of the oneness, of the higher oneness. All the spiritual systems tell, it, tell you that. All the religions tell you that. And all the sciences now are telling you that. So it's in us. Let's find it again by allowing this sense of oneness, this sense of communality, a sense of, of joining with the others, of commonness with others. Let allow this to come forward. Allow it to take care of us and to show the way forward. Because yes, there are solutions to everything, to every problem. We have the resources, we have the know-how, we have the technology, we have the people, everything is possible. Only we must do it together. If there's one tool I would recommend to learn how to drop in and hear from consciousness, hear from source, hear from the universe, it would be automatic writing because you're gonna get guidance. You're speaking with the universe, you're asking questions and you're getting answers. You're going quiet, you're putting your pen to paper and the answers begin to flow. So this program is over 40 videos, over eight modules that walks you through step by step. How do you get out of the mind? How do you drop into this process? Plus, we get together once a month on Zoom and help you improve your skills. So if there was one tool where you could literally put your pen to paper and say, where do I go from here? And all of a sudden your finger starts moving and you start getting answers, that's automatic writing. Pretty much every astronaut who has left the Earth and has looked back at her realizes that we are a closed system, realizes that we are one of seven billion cells, as you like to say, and, and that we are hurtling in this one giant spaceship together. How do, as you say, how do we allow this oneness to come back into us, particularly when there is, there is so much inequality and there's so many challenges. I'm, I'm here in California now. I'm in the high desert. It's beautiful here, but not too far in the way in the cities. There are now tent cities where people can't even afford a home. And that's here in the U.S., and the U.S. is, is obviously disproportional to the rest of the world. How do we start to shift this when we're so challenged? Well, that's the big question. The simplest answer is by being less selfish, less self-centered, and re realizing that we are part of each other. You see, I had the uh, pleasure and the honor to have a good friend in Edgar Mitchell, who was one of the astronauts, the yes. commander of Apollo 13, who was, I think, the third man to walk on the moon. He, he wrote and he told me, in, even in private conversations, that he had experiences that were way beyond the ordinary while he was up in space. He felt himself belonging here, that his home planet is one with him, he is one with it. And he, be, he felt that he's belonging to it. It changed his life. 
that's when he came back and uh, left NASA uh, to, uh, to went on his own. He, the first thing he did was founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences in California, which is dedicated to the, uh, to the research of consciousness. He recognized what it is. So, but we can't all be shot into space to get this recognition. You know, we can, if we have, if we are entering close to the portals of death and the near death experiences, mm -hmm. a similar experience takes place. But it's too much to ask that we should all go near, near dying just so that we can come up with this feeling, with this sense. We must find it on our own. And here we have resources in the sayings of the great sages. In, this, in, in the findings also, if you want to go and, and dig the sciences, particularly the new biology, the quantum biology, the quantum uh, psychology shows this very clearly. Cooperation, not competition. Oneness, not separateness. So when you get down to the business of living, so what do I do if you think do it? with other people, not do not exclude other people. Think about what it will do to the others. Be concerned with the whole. The whole is what is gives us life. We are part of we are children of the whole. We are children of the web of life. We are not above it. We are not beyond it. If we change our attitude, that's the chances we have. Change our mindset. We talk about the new paradigm, but that's what I mean, the new paradigm. A quantum paradigm. We are one with the world. That's what the quantum sciences is telling us, the new cosmology is telling us, the new psychology is telling us. It's time to realize, to wake up and do it. You and the tent city outside of Los Angeles are part of the same system. Whatever you do, do it in such a way that you don't take away the chances and the resources of people in tents or anywhere else in slums or wherever they live. Don't reduce their chances for having a better life. Let's work together in such a way that everybody has a chance to create a good life for themselves. We have the resources and the possibilities. Don't section it off. This is mine and that's yours. And I am only concerned about mine. A new business philosophy is always this. The stakeholders and the stakeholder is everybody in the big business today. It's not just the shareholders. There is, it, there's a new politics, the politics of we-ness, of us-ness, of togetherness. All of this is coming forward in the periphery. You know, you used to think that evolution takes place by the leading center, by the dominant center changing. It turns out that the dominant center in population biology doesn't change. It dies out. But change is occurring in the periphery and it moves to the center. When the center is destabilized, as it is destabilized now, then we have a chance for all these peripheral movements, new cultures, youth cultures, ecological cultures, vegan cultures, etc., etc. that these have a chance now to flourish, to move toward the center, because the power of the center has been shaken up. That's where we are, that's our chance. Thank you, and, and you have said, uh it's easy to feel hopeless at any point in this situation, to feel like, why does what I do matter? But when things have been shaken up, when we're in a time of system chaos, what is the periphery can easily become the center. What is, yeah. is, is very far outside the norm actually has a chance to very quickly become the norm, doesn't it? Exactly. You said the word chaos, and that's also the key. You know, we have theories, and we, have, we can apply them. We can simulate chaos in a system. And what we find that there are very tiny little effects, so-called butterfly effects. Yes. We apply any part of the system, and the whole system changes all of a sudden. In a, in a stable system, you have to kick it very hard. Yep. You have to have a dominant power to change. Then you have a chaotic system or an unstable system moving toward chaos. Chaos can be a creative condition as well. And when we have such a system, then your butterfly effects. A little butterfly flapping its wings over there in Southern California will create a storm in Mongolia because it gradually amplifies and amplifies and sometimes it picks up very fast. 
the pandemic picked up very fast. A tiny little change someplace, perhaps in China, we don't know exactly, probably, and that can, started to spread and it shook up the entire system, all of humanity. We can change it for the better also. We can create that little change by our changing mindset, by becoming different. Thank you. And I think I'm, I'm thinking back to the trip Jessica and I took that we're, we're, we're coming off of now. This is really the first interview since that trip. And we're still working through getting new systems in place. First off, I believe we can't go back and even trying to will really hurt us. Actually, let's go there. If we try, we feel very uncomfortable now because of the pandemic, because of all the changes, but trying to go back to a way things were or, or saying, I want the old way, that's kind of dangerous now, isn't it? It's not even possible. If you tried it, it will be very bad results. The old way was this self-centered, never mind the rest kind of a world way. And putting that back would be a crying shame. It, it would be almost like a crime against humanity. It's wasting that golden opportunity to change. Luckily, I say luckily, it seems paradoxical. It seems crazy, perhaps, at first sight. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we have this crisis. Let's find the antidote. Let's find the vaccines. Let's get out of the health aspect of the crisis. Let's all survive. But once we do that, let's not go back and create the old, unstable, inequitable, crisis-prone world. We cannot do it probably, but we could try and the results will be very bad, dangerous. So let's figure out who we are and then be the change. Who we are. We are not separate individuals. Think of Einstein, he says, separateness is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Nothing is really separate in the world. And that's the new sciences, all the quantum sciences, the new biology, etc. We are nothing can be separated of. We are not just a group of cells operating independent, independently. If you try to do that, we become a disease. If you keep doing it, we become a cancer. As long as we are healthy, we are part of that whole organism. And the organism is our, ourselves, our community, our nation, our, our civilization, and the, and the human family as a whole. Even beyond that, I would say the web of life, that is our community. Try to make that flourish, and we will flourish. Woohoo! You've you've got me thinking of a concept that I've I've never really thought of before. Although I think of when I take something off of the shelves at the grocery store, and I like to. I don't always, but I like to leave something there for the next person. If we operated on a concept, I'm going to call plus one right now. How much would things change if each step that we did, we thought for what? How will this help me? How will this help somebody else? How will this help me? How will this help somebody else? And if we take that plus one with each move we make, how quickly would we begin to change everything? We are in a crisis. And that's why things will move fast. Things will change. We have very little extra experience, hands-on experience, but we can try it. We have nothing to lose. We must try to have the plus one in everything we do. We must try to do one step better than we have been doing. One step more with solidarity and with togetherness. I think this can spread. It, it must spread because nothing can stay the way it is. If it doesn't spread, it breaks down. But if you are conscious people, we are conscious people, you and I, we can talk about it and we can recognize what, yeah. the situ what the situation is. And therefore, we can further it. We can, we can create the butterfly. We can be the butterfly. That is a positive butterfly. I have every, every confidence that we can make it, and we can make it very fast. Try it. You'll save the world. Thank you. Thank you. What is, we talk about this oneness and, and you're somebody who's really dove into the Akashic field. What is that or this? <laughs> it informs everything, but what is it and how does understanding that change everything right now? now the standard paradigm, which was associated with Newton, also, poor Newton, he wouldn't subscribe to most of what his followers are saying in his name. 
Yeah. Because he was a deeply spiritual person himself. Absolutely. But the Newtonian paradigm, as it as became known in, in the world, is a separatist one, is a, is, is a mechanical paradigm. Every little thing is separate from every other thing, basically. You can just take it out and change it. It's like a bicycle. If your pedal doesn't work well, you pull it off, take a screwdriver, pull it off, put in another pedal, and then maybe it works. You can't do that in a living system. You take out every part, and the rest of the organism is, is suffers. And it's good community. They change any part, and the whole community changes or, or suffers, unless it changes for the better. So we, are, we can recognize that we are different from what we thought we were. We are not separate little atoms moving about, only caring for ourselves. So our business philosophy is not just profit, because profit is for yourself. Profit, yes, but profit for what? Profit is for people and for planet. I would say truly planet, that's the first. If planet is healthy, people in it will be healthy. Life in it will be healthy. And then you can have profit. And then you can use profit to further this whole system. It's a whole different an angle. Not just your company alone, your environment, your society, all of humanity. Not too big, thinking too big. It's necessary to take it into account. These are not externalities. They used to, business used to talk about externalities, just environmental questions. No, they are very much fundamental. Every decision you make, whether you leave something else in a grocery store, or how you create your policy in, in, in business, what do you advertise, what do you, what you try to sell, all of that enters into the equation. What chances do we have to pull out of this crisis? Pull out well. Take the vaccine, yes. But in addition, you have to create a world and you have to create a new world. By plus one, then we can create a good world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm thinking of the concept of, of Gandhi. Uh, and all of these things have been turned into bumper stickers and waters down, but they're so powerful. Live simply so that others may simply live. Where does consumerism or consumerism gone awry fit into things and what do we do about that? Now, consumerism used to be the philosophy that the more you consume, the better it is. The better is for the, for the economy. Finally, you're a good person if you consume. Because the idea was, you know, just drive around with your car because then, then you need, then you're going to buy a new car every year and you buy more gas and that's good. You're driving the economy. And that's consumerism, just consumption for its own sake. Consume your share. Consume so that other people can consume their share. Have pay attention to what other people can have. Live in a way that other people can also live. As Gandhi said, live simpler so other people can simply live. But the simplicity doesn't mean in just being less complex. It means living well, responsibly living in a way that we don't detract the chances of other people to live as well. On a functional, you know, I'm, I'm going back to, I think it was Locke. I might be getting that wrong. Uh, many, many years ago, I was reading him, which is, is the idea of the pursuit of happiness and, and let not your pursuit of happiness affect somebody else's pursuit of happiness. But there's a limit to all of this, uh, there's a limit to um, live and let live, isn't there? Well, the old classical British analytic philosophy of the last 100, 150 years was a liberal philosophy, liberal ethics. It says, do anything you want to do, only don't break the law, you see? And, but this do everything means that the rich are taking an, un without breaking the law, taking an unfair share of the resources, are promoting their own interests at the ex expense of the interests of other people. It means that an unequal world is becoming more and more unequal because you allow to do things what they want as long as they don't break the law. We can't produce laws for everything. We can't dictate this from the outside. The laws have to come from the inside. We each have to know what it is that we need, that how far we can go. 
So what you're talking about is a new, I think kids get this. We'll go along the concept of plus one. A new moral ethic has to take place as a wave over the earth, which is what you're talking about, of this oneness. Because if we look at, for instance, if we look at the stock market, which was quarterly and now is, is daily, how are things doing today? What decisions can we make? How many people can we trim or cut or hurt or whatever today to get that stock price up? We have to come up with a completely new moral ethic that looks holistically at the system. You have said it. This is what I mean. This is the imperative. It's no longer a, a, a pious wish. It's no longer just an option. It's become an imperative, a necessity. We can't make it separately. We have got into this crisis very likely, although we don't know exactly what the causes of it were, but very likely because we have living in an increasingly in unnatural synthetic kind of an existence, eating more synthetically, living in, in a way, polluting the environment until the, our immune system is weakened. We no longer are part of that healthy, fl flourishing chain of life. And therefore, what comes a virus and it can, virus can spread. It finds an easy place on people who are separated themselves off from the oneness. From the force you mentioned a little while ago the force going with the force yes. but that force is there is in is in all of us is in us it's not out out there so it's everywhere so when when we go with the force when we go with the rhythms with the dynamics of nature of the universe it seems far-fetched you have to look at the universe to see what you're going to do but look at nature nature is an integral integral coherent system of life, and we have got to come back to that. Then we can move forward. Thank you. I want to talk about love versus fear for a minute. And, and I have watched very intelligent people getting sucked down one rabbit hole or another on the internet or another about global domination, or this is taking place, or if you take a vaccine, um, and I'll probably lose listeners for this, if you take a vaccine, you're going to become a zombie, or this or that is going to happen. There is so much disinformation. It's exceptionally difficult to figure out the truth right now. How do we bring it back to this upward spiral? Look up at the sky once in a while. Look at the clouds. If you can, now we're in a lockdown situation, at least part of the time in part of the world, but try to move out. Try to look, we have a beautiful countryside I see behind you. Try to walk, try to spend some time, a little bit beyond your immediate wants and surface desires. If you feel yourself or what you are, if you feel your, 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 your soul and your foot, touching the ground, literally, as well as metaphysically, as, 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 as just figurative, figuratively. But try to do that. You can find yourself again. Children have that natural instinct. It, it's in them. Artists, I think, have them, because they're looking for harmony. They're trying to express something that's coherent, that's meaningful. Try to find it. Be an artist, be a child again, okay. and then you end up by being a great scientist and also a saver of, of humanity. You can go back, allow yourself, allow your instinct, allow your natural setting in your life to come forth and to govern what you do. Oh, that just brought up a thank you. It's beautiful and it brought up an interesting point that we think of technology and science is is phenomenal and and where we're getting in our understanding of 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 quanta and oneness is is so important and kind of bringing us full circle and around the spiral but it is easy to get lost in that digital world and forget who and what we are you know, we thought that we create something that satisfies our immediate needs we need to have drinking water and then we bottle it in plastic bottles and store away the bottles. 
instead of drinking very often, not polluting the water around us and just drinking that. Yes. I mean, it's so simple to live in a more natural way. But we have to do it together and not relying always on the profit motive. Somebody always wants to make money out of everything that you want. Let's not allow that. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a question of just making, making money. It's a question of doing something good, not only being here, moving forward. I think that's a great motivation. If we can remember that you can do good, you will be doing good, and you'll be a great person. That is being the change you want to see in the world. What I keep thinking is, this is great for our kids. We're teaching our kids, but how do we take those actions on a daily basis for ourselves? But if we go out and, and it's more than the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm to others, <laughs> if it's a how can I do good each step of the way, that's where the great shift takes place. Yes. We have been trying to use stopgap measures, you know, trying to stop making more harm, reducing the level of bad in the world. But you have to increase the level of good. And that is not artificial. It is not something creating a new technology. That means creating yourself for what you truly are, not a separate little being who wants to consume more and more, who wants to have more and more money, who wants to have more and more power. All these things can be, can be striven for, but should be used for a proper purpose, used for a higher purpose. They're not, they are not ends in themselves. We are not here just to multiply our own wealth and our own power. We are here to advance the cause of humanity, the cause of life on the planet. I have a vision, and, and I think the vision actually came by watching Star Trek 20 or 30 years ago. And, and there is a, a, a prime directive about how you treat new civilizations and how they learn and grow. And I was thinking about that a long time ago, and, and it clicked that there must have been civilizations, and I now know there were, civilizations in the past that not only lived in balance, but promoted the arts, promoted the development of humanity, not the development of profit, two completely different things. And if we go back there to where we understand that the artist matters, that the scientist for science matters, that the uh, monk in a cave matters, that all of these things matter as much as the dollars and cents in a stock market actually matter a lot more, we create a society that is not only self-sustaining, but that then brings out the best in our species. And that's not something artificial, synthetic. That's not, not something arbitrary. You know, I'm reminded, you, you mentioned that you are now in Southern California near the desert. I live in Tuscany now. Yeah. And I overlook a valley. It's called the Valley of the Chechena River. And on the other side of the valley that I can just see is a town called Volterra. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the three major centers of the Etruscan civilization. We know little about the Etruscan civilization, except we know they had their art. Mm -hmm. We are beginning to decipher also their alphabet. This, uh, this civilization existed four or 5,000 years until the Romans came a few years, a, a few hundred years after the Romans had occupied this territory, the Etruscans just were melted away. They come, became absorbed in the powerful Roman Empire. But the Etruscan civilization is very interesting. They were sustainable for all those thousands of years. They lived in an egalitarian world. Men and women are always pictured together. They are doing the land together. They are making art together. They are, they are eating together. They are buried together. You see. This is a, as it was a, today we would say it's a vegan world because they lived off the net, off the of the earth, and they had not a great deal of animal husbandry at all. Mm -hmm. It's a sustainable world, a natural world. It was here. It's still here. I somehow feel its elements. I feel this this valley, which was continuously worked, not only inhabited, but worked, agriculturally worked for production for 5,000 years. The Romans came about 2,000 years ago, but the Etruscans were here. So it can be done. 
it, it wasn't so difficult for them. They lived, I think, as far as we can tell, as far as you can see the statues and the art. Yeah. They lived a contented, satisfied life, not full of suffering, not full of that idea of strain and stress and tragedy. Well, perhaps a kind of paradise, but it's possible everywhere, not only here. I think it's possible. Thank well, you. And the reverse, if we look at Mesopotamia, if we look at the Middle East as it is now, well, actually, we can go back to the Sphinx. And we can go to the Sphinx and we can see all the weathering from rain and understand that that was a very fertile ground a long time ago when we were doing what biologist Brian Goodwin calls the sacred dance. When we were in balance, it was a fertile ground. And that's what we get to go back to. That is the back. It's going much further back than the civilization, the Western civilization, the Western type of civilization. is going back to our source, to our origins. And it's going f further back. It doesn't mean living in it. People feel that they are feared and now they live primitively. We have, after all, we have modern medicine. We have all the modern comforts. So how do we, do, must we lose all that? Yeah. No, it's about talking about the mindset talking about ambition or aspiration, what we want, how we think of ourselves, that is what has got to change. Because ultimately, we do what we want to do within the limits of the possible. That's what we are striving for. We have so many possibilities. And now that we are climbing out, I think gradually and perhaps increasingly fast, climbing out of this, of this crisis, we really have the question is facing us. It's a style question. Okay, so now where? How do we go? Where do we go? Then the answer is back, but not back to what we had just now. Back to what we truly are and what a civilization truly can be. Sustainable, flourishing civilization. We have the technology. Yes, use the technology, but use it for that. We have the means. We have, we have the power. Let's do it instead of just being out looking for our self selfish immediate satisfactions. What brings you the greatest hope right now, Irvin? That I see new cultures arising. I see on the periphery new cultures, environmental cultures. People are beginning to say the kind of things that I knew what I had to say, what I had to think about. But before it was, you look like a hopeful, pious hope, a pie in the sky. And now people are talking about it. They're talking about, like you and I are talking about, the needs for holism, for thinking of, of we instead of me. And this is something that's arising. And I think this could spread. These are the butterflies that could create a storm. If you and I, we start the plus one, as you mentioned, everything that we do, we think a little bit more, not just of our own immediate ends, but what good does it do? If that is a guiding principle that could spread, and then the good will become real, and then we'll live in a better world. Woohoo! If you had one thing that you could share with somebody who is struggling, today, who's going, this is great. However, I'm in a day-to-day -day survival mode right now. What would you tell them? Yes, you have to survive. No question about it. But don't survive at the expense of other people. Allow other people to survive as well. This is actually a minimum consideration. Don't harm the world around you, whether it's people or nature. You have to survive, but survive so that other people can survive as well. That's the minimum. You have to ask as much of everybody. If you can do that, you will be rewarded because you were doing something which is really good and you will feel that. You will feel that it is something that you contribute. You're doing something. Your life has meaning. Whereas if you only survive from day to day, you can ask, what meaning does that have? You can have meaning. You can do good. 
because we are all in this together and we can all pull out of it together, join, join together. Even if it's a small, always, always be part of it. Thank you. A few more questions here. Um, and this, this is phenomenal. We could keep, keep going. I'm so thankful that we're speaking today, by the way, as the, the first interview that's getting going again, there's nothing more important than this. There literally is nothing, at least in the survival and, and evolution of our species, there's much, nothing more important than planting the seed today, Irvin. So let's look in a couple, a couple last key categories. First off, business. Because business has, the free market system has gone awry, has gone off of the rails. What do we do individually to help shift business today? We have got to rethink the purpose of business. Even if you just go back 100 years to the great captains of industry, Dale Carnegie, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rockefeller, Ford, and so on, these people have not thought of business as being there only to make profit. Mm -hmm. They thought of business as being doing good in society, as achieving a better life for people. And business become, became divorced from the world. What can we do? Try to bring business back into the world. It's a great thing to have a fight in communism. Communism said, you know, business is collective, the states will run the business. And, uh, you know, the private business is anatomy. Well, that's what's overdoing it. But the opposite is not the cure. Simply just to open the gate to everything. We talked about before about just doing everything as long as you don't break the law. Mm -hmm. You can't have business that can do anything as long as it doesn't break the law. And of course, try to find subterfuge all this to get around the law as much as possible. Try to do business in a way that you feel good about it. Yes, that when you feel good about it, you'll be doing something more than creating your own immediate selfish interest you will be representing a broader, a wider interest, a deeper interest. If you can feel good about what you're doing in business, you will be doing good business. Thank you. And then the second piece, it was interesting that you mentioned communist state, because that word state and nation state uh, uh, comes to mind. I was talking with a customer service rep for a cell phone company a couple days ago who didn't even realize the script that they were saying. We had given away $2 billion worth of services, and so we stopped doing that, and now we give away a quarter million dollars a year to a POW foundation. And I'm going, wait, wait a second. You were helping a whole bunch of people, and you said, we've got to stop doing that, and now we're only gonna help a fractional amount of people. We get into, whether it's in, in our corporate mindset, whether it's at the government department of motor vehicles, whether it's as an individual nation state, we support our policies and nobody else's. As the expression has gone here, America first. What is wrong with this? How do we shift this and say, wait a second, the way we've structured things has taken us as individuals, but we're still on one blue dot, one, one small rock of a spaceship. Think of it, what it is that you want to serve. What, what service do you want to make in your life? The idea of the nation state is a very curious one. The Peace of Westphalia, that's 1732 or so, that was born. And it was the idea that a nation state has is sovereign. It's responsible only for its own people. Its people, you can not be responsible for anything outside of its own people. And that has led not to the United Nations. It led to the situation where the United Nations is a contradiction in terms. As long as a, as a nation is a sovereign nation, it can be united. Mm -hmm. And I know I've worked for seven years at the United Nations as director of research. I know the struggle that one has, always dealing with national delegations that are out to pursue the interests of their own government mm -hmm. and not concerned about how they can cooperate and create a better situation with the others. The United Nations can do a lot of wonderful things. The staff and the secretariat is, are, are holistic thinking people. But the nation state representatives are creating the nation state's philosophy and maintaining that philosophy. Just us. 
it is make, make, make Germany first, make Italy first, make America first, make Mexico first. 190 or so nation states, you see. If you want to make each of them separate first, what happens to the rest? We are trying to do that. We have been trying to do that. We've been tra- ta- taking apart the system. It's been breaking apart at the seams. We can't do that. If we want to put something first, take the web of life on the planet first. Then humanity is a part of that. If you want to, if you want to make it great, if you want to make humanity great, if you want the United States great, make all of states, all the states, all the nations of the world, all the families of the world great. Then we'll be great. It talks. It seems like just you know, just uh, idealistic chatter, but it's very real. The new from the new biology, from the new population systems, from the new uh, demographics. Whenever a society is cooperative, works with others, it flourishes. The world around it is flourishes. When it cuts itself off from the rest, only tries to represent its own interests. Sooner or later, it becomes unstable, runs into a crisis, and cannot sustain itself. This is one world. This is one planet. We are thoroughly in it, and we can we must only pursue it together. The planet great, or none of us are great, but we can make the planet great, and we can make each other ourselves great. Woo-hoo. It makes me think that the wobble at the top that's going on, particularly by things like America First, are actually the chaos that we need to help us with this beautiful, massive shift. Irvin, where can people go to find your beautiful work, to find this book, and to find out more? Well, this book is called, somewhat optimistically, it's called uh, How We Can Build a Better World. But the subtitle is interesting because I consider this a manual. So I call it the World Shift Manual. It's a kind of a handbook, how to shift the world toward a better world. And so this is on the internet now. You find it under my name, Erwin Laszlo, How We Can Build a Better World. And there will be uh, there are e-books, there are audio books available, there, there are print-on-demand books, and the printed book will come out in, by March. But right now, we can, we can order all these things on the internet. And I'm here. I'm ready to discuss this as we are doing it now. I'm going to represent these ideas we can find a way beyond the crisis in which we are now, and we can build a better world. We can do it. And that's the message I want to leave with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Irvin, this has been so beautiful. I am I'm honored each time you're on. I'm honored that you're doing this work and that you're, you're tirelessly doing this work. You, I believe, are on fire and on a mission with every breath you have to help shift I want to say shift consciousness, but consciousness is doing all right. <laughs> shift the planet at this time, so I cannot thank you enough. You know, Michael, you are an inspiration. Not an inspiration, you can say inspire Urban because you are helping me. Wonderful to talk with. Woohoo! So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying be well, have fun, get how we can build a better world and begin building a better world for yourself and others today and above and beyond all else like Irvin who is my inspiration shine bright Woo-hoo! thank you so much for watching I hope you enjoyed this latest interview as much as I did for more on how you can up level your life click on the links below for our mini master classes for our boot camps and for a very limited availability one-on-one coaching with me Be sure to give this a huge thumbs up if you like this. Leave your comments below and you can check out more amazing videos here and here. Love you guys so, so much. Shine bright. Woohoo!